thank you for joining Eastern Florida State College for a very special public affairs program as we commemorate the signing of the United States Constitution on September 17th, 1787, 234 years ago. My name is Christopher Muro, political science professor serving on the Melbourne campus, and it is my honor and privilege to be your host for today's program. EFSC continues to be a leader in the Florida college system with its unmatched commitment to civic engagement and responsibility. Today's Constitution Day celebration further undergirds the college's role in fostering engagement and civility within our public discourse in our community, our state, and our nation. The United States Constitution does many things. It creates and organizes the structure and functions of our government. It separates power. It creates checks and balances. And it provides a framework for the protection of basic human rights. While it's impossible to cover all of the aspects of our Constitution in one program, today we will focus on specific constitutional principles, like our coveted freedom of speech and voter participation. Our guests for today's debate and discussion are two distinguished members of the Florida Legislature, representing State House District 47, Democratic Representative Anna Eskamani, and representing State House District 51, Republican Tyler Saroy. Welcome to you both, and thank you for being here. Before we begin today, allow me to thank some of the many people that helped to make today's program possible. Thank you, EFSC administration officials, for your steadfast support. My colleague on the COCO campus, Professor Josh Humphreys, and Chief uh, Director of Production, John Bober, and his entire team at WEFS-TV. Thank you for your support and your help. Again, thank you, legislators, for being here and taking the time to celebrate the Constitution and our freedoms that we enjoy. Representative Eskamani, welcome again, and, and please tell us about <coughs> District 47, what it's like to live there, and some of the challenges that your, your voters are facing there. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here alongside my colleague, Representative Saroy. Um, District 47 represents parts of Orange County, specifically the city of Orlando, Winter Park, Belle Isle, and Edgewood. It's a very long district, and it's a very diverse district. Uh, we have folks of every economic background, of every cultural identity, everyone who just is working to pursue the American dream and make the state the best possible state to live, work, and play. Uh, in particular, the issues that are super important to us have ranged from affordable housing, um, we are really struggling in my district when it comes to housing security and especially with the cost of rent going up and also uh, the peak of inflation. We're seeing a lot of folks struggle to make ends meet. Um, of course, uh, the environment is a major issue of concern for us. We're inland. We're locked uh, in the land in Orange County. but We have beautiful lakes around us and folks are very conscious of climate action and want to see more sustainable decisions be made from their local governments. And then, of course, for a lot of us, it's just been navigating the pandemic. You know, folks continue to be very concerned about the Delta variant um, and some of the other aspects of the impacts of COVID-19 that we're continuing to deal with the unemployment system and other types of safety nets, make sure folks are going to continue to thrive and survive in District 47 across the state. And you were first elected uh in yes, I was first elected in 2018, uh, flipping a legislative seat and uh, maintaining my role in public service by winning my reelection in 2020. So really proud uh, to earn the trust of my diverse district and to be representing the people of Florida in the legislature. Well, thank you so much. We, again, we appreciate you being here. And Representative Saroy, uh, District 51, tell us about District 51. Yes, well, good morning, and thank you very much again for having us today, Professor Representative Eskamani. Always a pleasure to see you. 
Uh, House District 51 includes Cape Canaveral, Cocoa, Cocoa Beach, uh, Rockledge, and, and here uh, the campus of Eastern Florida State here in Cocoa. So very proud to represent this district, uh, was elected in 2018. And I'd say, you know, of the, the top two or three things that are most important to my constituents, uh, definitely uh, getting our economy back on track, doubling down on the policies that made us one of the strongest economies in the country, uh, focusing our efforts on the continued growth and development of commercial aerospace. Uh, of course, the Indian River Lagoon uh, is a top priority. We'll continue to focus on projects like septic, septic to sewer conversions and muck dredging uh, because that, that uh, lagoon restoration is going to be a, a long generational problem to fix and is just so important to, uh, to the residents of our county. Fantastic. Well, we again appreciate you being here and taking the time to celebrate the Constitution of the United States, a freedom of speech, and of course I'm very excited about our topic today, uh, which is dealing with voter uh, participation. In particular, uh, we're going to have, again, we focus a lot at the college on civility in our public discourse. And so uh, what we're finding is, is that uh, when we engage in discussions of these very important topics, uh, that sometimes uh, we're, we're not seeing the level of civility that we would like to see. And so part of what we're doing today is helping to restore the principle that we can, we can disagree without being disagreeable. Uh, and this particular topic I know is very controversial and a lot of people are very passionate about it. Uh, our topic for today's debate, the resolution is as stated, that the Florida legislature's passage of Senate Bill 90 was necessary and proper to strengthen the integrity of our state's election process. For the benefit of our viewing audience, uh, before the 2020 election, the battle over elections was a struggle over requiring voter identification with a government identification card and uh, perhaps even uh, limiting uh, ballot initiative process. Post-2020, however, a new battle has emerged over the actual ballot casting process. Senate Bill 90, among other things, would restrict ballot drop box access, eliminate so-called ballot harvesting, and regulate the requesting of ballots by mail. So there are a number of states uh, across the country, Texas, Georgia, Arkansas, Iowa, and of course Florida, that have enacted some of these restrictions. <clears throat> the proponents of Senate Bill 90 will call this election security, while its detractors call it voter suppression. Well, hopefully after today's debate, we'll have some more clarity on this issue. Uh, beginning with our debate today, our first speaker who will be affirming the resolution that Senate Bill 90 was necessary and proper, our first affirmative speaker, Representative Saroy, you've got six minutes. Thank you again. Thank, thank you again, you. Professor, and uh, thank you, Representative Escamana. You know, you spoke about civility in your opening remarks, and I, I can tell your audience that uh, working with Representative Escamani is, is an honor and a privilege. And I, I do think that we could teach Washington a thing or two about uh, <laughs> how to engage in this business and these debates in a civil manner and have, have good discussion as a result and still be friends at the end of the day. Uh, to, your, to your viewers, I would say this. First of all, on this issue uh, regarding the elections bill that we the legislature just passed and that I was proud to vote for, um, you know, hopefully today, if you listen, you will take away from this discussion uh, what the bill is really about and what it accomplishes. Because I, I think that uh, the media narrative certainly has contributed, along with social media, uh, has contributed to a narrative that this bill is somehow extreme, that this bill is, is off base. And you're going to hear that it's an effort to disenfranchise people or to, or to otherwise limit access to the polls. This bill is anything but that. Uh, when you take a look at the actual text, what this bill does is it increases the level of security, transparency, and integrity in our elections process, plain and simple. There's no trickery involved. There's no games involved. It is about integrity and security. So what the bill does is it, it requires a couple of different things to, toward that end. 
first of all, it requires uh, two forms of identification to be produced when you make a change to your voter registration. We may recall uh, last summer, uh, an individual filed a registration change for the governor himself. I think changed the governor's address uh, as a result, was able to do that, I think, over the telephone calling an elections office. So what this bill does is it puts in place a check that when you're calling to make a change, which is fairly routine for most people, you're changing an address, you're updating a phone number, uh, that that operator that you're reaching on the other end of that phone is going to ask you to, to verify your identification, just like you would if you're calling to pay your power bill or your phone bill or you're calling your doctor's office. They're going to ask you for your date of birth. They may ask you for the last four digits of your Social Security number. This is a very, this is a very ordinary practice for people to do when you're conducting a transaction over the telephone. The other thing that this bill does is it limits an open-ended absentee ballot request. Uh, the absentee ballot request now will have to be renewed by voters every two years. Again, this is something that uh, places the, the responsibility on the voters to make sure that their information is up to date and correct with the elections office. And, and during that contact, when you're renewing your absentee ballot request, you're providing them with the most recent up-to-date information. And the one thing I would note about absentee ballots, unlike many other states, in Florida, you don't have to have a reason to request an absentee ballot. You can call for, for any reason, you won't be asked. You can call and request to receive your ballot by mail. Again, that's something that provides great accessibility and convenience to our voters. The other thing that this bill does is it removes from the return absentee ballot envelope the denotation of a party affiliation. So when that absentee ballot is traveling through the mail, you're not going to see Democrat or Republican printed on the envelope anymore. Again, that's an important step to provide uh, the security and integrity for individuals that are choosing to vote uh, through absentee ballots. The other thing that this bill does, unlike other states, is you actually have to request an absentee ballot to receive one in the mail. In Florida, this bill will outlaw supervisors of elections taking it upon themselves to just blanketly mail out ballots. We saw that going on across the country as a result of the pandemic, but we're not going to allow that in Florida because, again, you have a responsibility to determine whether or not you want to request an absentee ballot, whether or not you want to take advantage of the up to 14 days of early voting, which you can vote at any early voting site regardless of your uh, residence in the county, or if you want to choose, you can vote in your precinct on election day. All three of those things that I just described equal anywhere between 40 and 45 days of opportunity to go and cast your vote. So the idea that this bill limits uh, accessibility to the polls, I, I just think is, is a false narrative and, and not doing the bill uh, justice in terms of being about election security and integrity. The last two things that the bill does, uh, number one, ballot harvesting. This is the concept that one person can collect and return multiple ballots to the elections office. People, people should not uh, be in possession of these ballots. They're, they're incredibly important documents. It's something that, that should be returned to the election supervisor to follow the proper, proper procedure. And by allowing har ballot harvesting, you're effectively putting one person in charge of whether or not you and your neighbors or anybody else that happens to come into possession of these ballots knows how to get them back proper to the, properly to the elections office. This change in the bill resolves a 2000, I believe it's a 2012 recommendation by a grand jury in South Florida that says ballot harvesting should be illegal because that person cannot be entrusted to do the right thing with those ballots. And in that instance, you actually saw an individual that was in possession of dozens of ballots return them to a county commission office, not even the elections office. So this is something that that bill, uh, that our bill contemplates as well. Finally, on the issue of drop boxes, our, our legislation requires uh, drop boxes uh, to be advertised to the public 30 days before their placement. They have to be told, the, the pu voting public has to be told where those ballot drop boxes are located. And the supervisor of elections is compelled to provide security for those drop boxes so they're not unattended. Uh, these are all things that are, that are common sense. And when it comes to our elections process, it's not a, a one-time proposition. We should be working on election security session after session. Thank you very much, Representative Saroy. And for the first uh, six-minute negative, Representative Escamani.
Well, thank you so much, Professor, and thank you, Representative Soroy. It's great to be here with you um, in Brevard County and, of course, to have the civil dialogue around legislation. I wish there was more of this every single day. Um, and so I, I do appreciate the opportunity to unpack uh, the negative of Senate Bill 90. So some of Florida's original pioneers, there was a saying that your life, liberty, and property are at risk when the Florida legislature is in session. And I could not agree more uh, for this past session when so many of our foundational rights were not only at risk, but legislation was passed to make it much more difficult to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, Governor Ron DeSantis, following the 2020 election cycle, held a press conference uh, celebrating Florida's election process, calling it the gold standard. In fact, Secretary Laura Lee, who serves as our Secretary of State who oversees the election process, um, also celebrated our election results in the sense that they were secure, they were uh, full of integrity, and there was transparency in the process. In fact, um, our election results were known uh, very, very soon after compared to other states where we were still waiting for all the vote by mail ballots uh, to be collected. No doubt Florida learned lessons the hard way with past election cycles where there were concerns of integrity and concerns of transparency where we count vote by mail ballots much more effectively than our, our other states. And so this was celebrated after the 2020 session. So you can imagine my surprise when I get to Tallahassee for the 2021 session and this is on the table as an issue of concern. And, and for me I found it to be quite ironic because uh, our Republican leadership was celebrating election process and results in Florida, um, not concerns of fraud. It was such an outrage that even Republican supervisor of election officials, including Alan Hayes, a former representative in the legislature, um, expressed opposition to Senate Bill 90 because they did not see parts of the bill as being uh, uh, designed to actually support election integrity, but really designed not only make the process more difficult, uh, but also make the process more difficult and expensive for our local supervisors. Um, I, I echo that they're um, in moderation. We should always revisit election security and do what we can to uh, deflect and uh, reinforce security so that we don't have foreign interference but at the end of the day Florida's elections were run very very well and even Republicans in the, the supervisor election uh, association alongside Democrats oppose these changes. I do want to add that what Florida has done is part of a national movement across 48 states at least we saw over 389 bills filed to restrict the process of voting. So this is not original to Florida. Um, this is tied to a larger narrative around the country that the 2020 presidential election was fraudulent when there really is not any evidence to back up those claims. Furthermore, we actually did have election fraud in Florida. It was uh, continues to be investigated, taking place among fake candidates running in specific state Senate races. Senate Bill 90 did nothing to address what is an open criminal investigation right now into these sham candidates, which I would argue if we are concerned about election fraud, that would be one of the biggest issues for us to tackle. Um, now, with that said, I do want to stress that election security is very important. And in fact, 4.8 million people voted in 2020 with 1.5 voting by mail. And they utilized the drop off boxes. They utilized uh, the ability to request vote by mail ballots. Um, part of this, these changes, and my representative um, colleague did outline some parts of the bill, but there were a few that we didn't mention that I want to lift up. So it does completely change the vote by mail process and saying that uh, a vote by mail ballot has to be renewed with every election election. In the past, a voter could request it for more than two, for at least two elections upcoming. That has been canceled by this bill. There are going to be voters right now who don't even know they're not going to get a vote by mail ballot. And if they're not notified, they might not even be, be able to actually vote based on their different disability statuses and their ability to go to a polling location. So this is really going to impact seniors and veterans and those with disabilities. Uh, we also know that um, uh, my colleague referred to ballot harvesting, which it was already illegal in Florida that if you were financially benefiting from collecting ballots, um, that that's a criminal act. But now it re restricts it that if you're even trying to collect ballots for senior citizens at a at assistant living home, 
that if you're just being a good Samaritan to do that, now that you're, you're gonna be criminalized under this new law. So we really are criminalizing uh, just good citizens who wanna help make sure that seniors and others who are potentially unable to drop off that ballot on their own, that they can actually vote. It also punishes supervisor of elections in different ways. You know, prohibits a supervisor of election office uh, from accepting uh, any type of nonprofit contributions to help staff up. You know, these are very expensive changes being made by the supervisor elections office. And now we're also saying that if you are trying to apply for a civic engagement grant, for example, from a nonprofit foundation, you cannot do that. Um, and I think one of the other changes that were ignored was giving more power to the governor. The governor will now have authority to appoint elected officials for local uh, county positions if that position becomes vacant versus host a local election. And then finally, it bans the disbursement of food and water uh, from volunteers to those voters who are waiting in line, and it makes the voter registration process much more difficult. So I look forward to um, hearing more uh, perspective from my colleague, but I, I do think that a lot of these changes are ultimately designed to make it more difficult to vote and all 67 counties as supervisor election authorities uh, and officials oppose the bill. Thank you very much <clears throat> for your opening comments. For our first affirmative rebuttal, Representative Soroy, you've got four minutes for rebuttal. Thank you very much. The, the one thing that I want to get to right away is this notion of, of the bill banning, you know, the opportunity to give cold water to people at the polls. And I, you know, I hold uh, President Biden responsible for kind of throwing that uh, suggestion out there that this, this bill and bills like them, you know, in Georgia are going to prevent, you know, people on a hot day from getting cold water at their polling locations. This, the, the prohibition in the bill uh, is so much more than bottled water. And I, I think, do, you know, claiming that that is somehow just a cruel thing to do to people uh, really misses the mark in terms of what this is really about. This is about trading things of value for votes, plain and simple. You know, there are instances around the country where you have something called pizza at the polls. Various groups offer just what it sounds like, pizzas, for people to come out and get a free meal. And while they're there, you know, hopefully they'll have the opportunity to vote. Our, our voting is a, is a sacred constitutional right. It is a responsibility and duty that we all share as citizens. Really, in this time of division in our country, our, our constitutional duty to vote is one of the few things left that binds us all together. Uh, the notion that you would do that for a hamburger or a pizza or a cold bottle of water or a Visa gift card, to me, is appalling. So what the bill does is it creates, it, it expands on that no solicitation zone around our polling locations. And that affects even, even Representative Escamani as I as candidates. We have to stay outside that zone while we're campaigning. What goes on outside of that uh, no solicitation zone, the supervisor of elections and the poll deputy that is there has no control over those activities. But once voters go inside that zone, they fall within the no solicitation area and they should not be given any freebies or handouts in terms of being there, being there to vote. The other, and, and we're all aware of this, you know, as a candidate myself, I've been outside polling locations. It, it becomes very passionate. It can be, get very loud. People can be very aggressive in terms of advocating for their uh, subject or their candidate. You know, if I, if I had a nickel for every time I heard YMCA or uh, Macho Man while I was out there at my polling location, I'd be a wealthy man right now. Uh, and, and that music was just blaring and people were very active. So, so this bill, you know, the no solicitation portion of that bill is really a subject to uphold uh, both the integrity uh, of the process, the security of it to make sure people aren't intimidated when they're walking through a, a parking lot to get to their polling location. Uh, and again, to make sure people aren't being traded something of value in exchange for their vote. Um, the other thing that I wanna touch on, you know, is about assisted living facilities. There are current provisions in Florida law created by the legislature, just like Senate Bill 90, that provides for supervised voting and assistance for people that need help in an assisted living facility or other kind of scenario for them to get the accommodations that they need. So the suggestion that this is somehow throwing people out and is gonna prevent them from being able to vote based on some disability or medical issue is, is to me, frankly, misleading. You know, one example would be that you could sign your voter registration form with an X if you have difficulty writing. Your, uh, these assisted living facilities can request of their local election supervisor to have staff come in of multiple party affiliations to assist people with their voting. So all of the things that we've seen regarding election laws in the state of Florida, yes, have been prompted by the legislature. 
And of the examples that I list, I hope people see that this is not in response to 2020. Our efforts to, to provide greater election security and transparency have been going on for years. Elections bills are routine. This is the latest one. I hope there will be future ones because our elections are always something we should strive to be improving. Thank you, Representative Soroy. And our first negative rebuttal, Representative Escamani, you've got four minutes. Thank you so much. Well, I hope there will be future election bills because my hope with that would be that we put into place automatic voter registration. We put into place opportunities to make voting much more accessible for people um, while maintaining the security that we all care about. Uh, my concern, though, is that this bill is a reaction to, to not just the 2020 election cycle, but it's part of a history of the Florida legislature making it more difficult to vote. Ten years ago, when I was a college student, I remember legislation that was filed and passed to completely upend the voter registration process, which was, again, a process that had no concerns of, of fraud, and yet the legislature pursued changes just to make the process more difficult for advocates who care enough to volunteer and help their fellow Floridian get registered and get out to vote. Um, now, I, I want to be clear. Um, if the bill was just focused on election security and uh, mo modern changes to make sure that the data is accurate, um, I think you'd have a lot of bipartisan support for those ideas. Those are shared values we all have. But unfortunately, that's not what the bill's intention was. Uh, the bill was completely designed to respond uh, to a national uptick of restrictive bills, and it mim mimics what we saw in Georgia and other states as well. Now, parts of the bill that my colleague outlined, I just want to also add more emphasis to, in particular, um, when it comes to ballot harvesting, that was already something that was not allowed. But the, the changes that were made really are designed to target good Samaritans who are just trying to help folks turn in their ballots without any personal or financial gain. Um, if they had a personal financial gain, they it was a criminal act already. Um, I also just want to emphasize on this point about um, you know giving out water or food and things like that. Um, giving me a bottle of water is not going to get me to vote for someone in a certain way. You know, I, I look at my voters um, and Floridians across the state, and these are strong and passionate people, right? I mean, we talk about water at the polls because it's hot and the lines are long, and we want to make sure that folks, whether you're voting for a Democratic candidate or a Republican candidate or someone who has no party affiliation, that you stay in line and vote. Um, we do know that folks have fainted while waiting in line, that the heat in Florida, um, especially during election season, is very, very difficult to stay in line the entire time. And because of low resources to our supervisor of elections, um, they don't have enough staff, uh, enough resources to even make sure that these locations are going to have short lines. And that's why the drop-off boxes were so important and effective because it also offered an alternative for voters not to wait in line. And the changes in Senate Bill 90 are going to lead to a reduction of drop-off boxes. And if you have a reduction of drop-off boxes, if you have more expenses to local governments, because now they have to notify voters of changes and notify voters uh, around vote by mail, that they're gonna spend more money on these new burdensome bureaucratic rules that they're not going to have enough staff on election day to even make the process as smooth as we all need it to be to the point where there, there, there won't be long lines. And so we have to be very intentional in working with local governments to pursue strong election policy. And again, the fact that overwhelmingly Democratic and Republican election officials oppose this bill, I think speaks to the fact that it's not good policy. It's very much designed to make it more difficult to vote under this disguise of election security. Um, and so with that said, I, I just want to add to that the changes in Senate Bill 90 are going to impact Democratic voters and Republican voters. Like this is not even going to, you know, just target one group of people over the other. We know that as I mentioned earlier, 1.5 million Floridians voted by mail in 2020, and they've been President Trump won the state. So, so this is a bill that is going to have huge ramifications, not just for Democratic voters, but also for Republican voters and for our senior population who relies really heavily on vote by mail. Thank you very much, Representative Eskamani. Uh, we now, now come to one of my favorite parts of the debate structure and that is our cross-examination. And for the first negative cross-examination, Representative Escamani will have five minutes to ask uh, questions of Representative Soroy in a uh, rapid-fire 
cross-examination format is. Again, it's one of my favorite components of the debate. You'll have five minutes to ask your questions, Representative Escamani, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Representative Saroy. It feels like the House floor. Um, do you know of any supervisor of election officials who support Senate Bill 90 in Florida? No, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. I, I, I don't, but I, I haven't sought that information out. You know, one of our our responsibility, our constitutional duty uh, is to be the policymakers in our state. And our election supervisors are, are in the role of being administrators. And their job is to take the law that we craft uh, through the process that we have in Tallahassee. Uh, this process played out in terms of Senate Bill 90. There was plenty of opportunity for debate, questions, public input. Uh, we sent a bill to the governor, it was signed. So it's the job now of our election supervisors to administer that law. During that debate process in the committee spaces, did you hear from supervisor election officials that said they did not like the bill? You know, I, I talked to our supervisor of elections here in Brevard, uh, Lori Scott, a uh, very capable professional, a, a career uh, professional who, who started out in the legislature. And, you know, I have a high degree of confidence in her, and, and I think, uh, you know, part of what I took away from those conversations is that there, were, there are good and bad things about the bill. But, but you and I serving together, I think, would agree that there are good and bad things about all the bills uh, <laughs> that come through. Um, uh, okay, fair enough. Uh, so talking about election fraud in Florida, were there any reported cases of election fraud that, that you know, we can reference to back up the support of this bill? You know, I, I think that there are the ones that I am familiar with uh, have to do with, with residency. Uh, issues where uh, individuals have a vacation home, maybe in another state, North Carolina, for example, uh, and, and they are found to have voted in North Carolina and also have voted in Florida. And I think one of the things that we could do to correct that, uh, we probably need to take a look at Florida residency requirements and, and strengthen that up a little, you know, make it a little bit tighter. Uh, a lot of the arguments that you hear from these folks are, well, I, I may have a vacation home in North Carolina. I pay taxes to the, my, the city up there. You know, I should be able to vote in that, in that city. Uh, but of course, you and I understand that the problem is not so much voting in the city council election. It's that they've now cast two votes for president. Uh, and that's where you, you run into the problem. So, you know, those, those are the issues that I'm aware of. You certainly have the grand jury uh, recommendations from, from Miami, the ballot harvesting that occurred down there. You have other examples, you know, just because it's not often reported in the news doesn't mean that it didn't happen. You have examples around the country. We talked about pizza of the polls. Uh, I think it was in California, you had individuals who were arrested and indicted for trading money and cigarettes and other things for trying to get people to turn out to vote. So yes, in Florida, we had, a, we had an excellent election in 2020, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't always be taking a look at what is going on around the rest of the country and in our own state in terms of making the process stronger. Um, why, why did Senate Bill 90 not address anything with the sham candidate races? And do you think it should include something around that if we are serious about election fraud? You know, I, I, I think that when you're looking at the way um, candidates approach filing for office, we can always do more diligence in making sure that, that the qualifications for office are being met, uh, that residency requirements are being met. But there is, a, there is a process in place for people to take uh, complaints regarding our qualifications for office. You can file that complaint with the uh, Florida Elections Commission and, and have it heard. Um, you know, again, if there's something that needs to be corrected there, we always have the opportunity to file legislation and to, to pursue that. Um, but yeah, you know, when it comes to the security of our elections, the integrity of our candidates, we should be looking at all of our options. Do you think Senate Bill 90 makes vote by mail much more difficult to, to do? I don't. I don't. You know, as a part of our civic process, paying taxes is a very complicated process. Filing for office, is, as you and I know, requires paperwork and an oath and disclosures. Uh, what we're asking people to do here is to call in and make a request. Now every, every election cycle. Uh, they have to provide two forms of identification to verify that they are the individual making the ask. Um, and now they have, you know, a number of options in terms of getting that ballot uh, returned to the elections office. So I don't, I don't think voting in and of itself is a difficult process in Florida. As we talked about earlier, you have between 40 and 45 days to cast your ballot. If you're worried about the heat, call your election supervisor and request a ballot by mail. If, you, if you're running errands and you have the opportunity to stop in an early voting site, regardless of where you live in the county, 
stop in and, and you know, cast your ballot uh, at a site of your convenience. You know, Florida law, because of our legislature, the residents of our state have anywhere between eight and 14 days of early voting. Absentee ballots go out nearly 35 days before the election. I think military and overseas are, are sooner. So if you miss both of those windows, you have the option of going to your polling location on election day. Accessibility, accessibility is not an argument that holds water with me. So how about for folks that are working families, folks that don't have transportation, folks who you know do live with a disability, folks mm-hmm. who, who have different barriers that make it much more difficult to actually sure. get out and go vote. Um, is this bill gonna make their life easier to vote or more difficult to vote? I don't think it really changes in terms of the options that already exist. Um, if accessibility is an issue, you know, we use we talked about assisted living facilities earlier. There are provisions in Florida law where the, the administrators, the folks in that facility can make a request to have elections officials come in and to assist them with casting their vote. Vote. I think that we are are very accommodating in terms of the signature verification process that is on those absentee ballots. Uh, our our uh, elections officials, and remember, it's just not one person making these decisions. It's a canvassing board that often includes a judge, the supervisor of elections, and a county commissioner or designee. And when these signature issues come up in terms of verifying an identity, they put it up on a screen in a room of a publicly noticed meeting, and they discuss it as a board, and they match that signature against the signature that's on file. If it's a person that's experiencing difficulty, oftentimes that registration form is just marked with an X, and the the elections canvassing officials know immediately that that's someone that has difficult writing or they have a a power of attorney uh, signing their signature in place form. The voter will write that on there to the best of their ability uh, and we move forward. So, you know, I have a high degree of confidence both in accessibility and the convenience of voting in our state. But ultimately the responsibility rests with the voters uh, to do their part uh, to get that ballot back to the elections office. Thank you, representatives. That was a lot of fun. I'm having a lot of fun with this already. (laughs) And I'm looking forward to Representative Soroy. You now have five minutes for the affirmative cross-examination. Thank you very much. Earlier, you referred to um, same-day voter registration. And I'm I'm curious, you know, just what does that what does that mean? And, you know, what if, if you were in the majority in the House of Representatives, what does that bill contain? So I believe I said automatic voter registration. So my my vision is that when you become 18, you automatically are registered to vote. So it's not something that you have to you know, pursue the process of actually applying. That you do have to, of course, make the decision to actually go vote. But when you go to a, to a polling location, uh, you're already registered to vote. And, and I say that because of my experience with working with a lot of college students, college students are very transient. And um, go- going to UCF myself, so many students from South Florida that either were registered to vote in South Florida or never knew they had to get registered to vote because it just wasn't something that was implemented into their educational curriculum, which I'll mm-hmm. add, I, I, I do think we should also beef up the civics education so students know they can get pre-registered to vote at age 16 or 17. Um, but we would have different situations with students that uh, thought that they were ready to vote and would be waiting in line at UCF, get to the actual desk and realize that either they're never registered to vote or the registered vote in South Florida and they have to fill out a provisional ballot, which chances are will not get counted. So mm. thinking about young people and just the voting patterns of transient young people, um, something like automatic voter registration would allow them to be registered to vote at the current address that they live in based on their driver's license information. Um, and, and from there they can update it. And some different counties that have better digital capacity, like Orange County where I am, we actually can change addresses the day of because we're all using tablets at the point locations. Mm-hmm. So I do think beefing up just the ability to also update information in real time, work with databases in other states to prevent that double voting from ever occurring mm-hmm. would all be good policies for us to consider. So do you support a national voter registration database? Um, I, I support Florida working with other states to ensure that when folks move, that data is updated. And Florida actually has already joined uh, different national databases to check to make sure that mm. um, for someone who has moved a location, that they're not going to be getting a ballot in North Carolina and in Florida, that they, they're just voting in one state. So under our, our Constitution and laws, you know, the, the responsibilities rest with us as citizens uh, to do things like participation in jury duty, which requires effort and and. Uh, activity on our part as citizens. 
registering and performing military service also requires uh, a high degree of paperwork preparation, responsibility, and active involvement on our part as citizens. These are responsibilities that we engage in. Um, paying taxes, I referred to earlier, uh, uh, you know, for, for a lot of people, a very burdensome process that you obviously are, are highly uh, engaged in in terms of getting completed. Why, why should registering to vote be something that is automatic and not just another uh, responsibility that we as active and responsible citizens have to make an effort to engage in? Well, arguably collecting taxes is quite automatic because I pay a sales tax every time I shop. And so I do think that some systems in government are automatic. Mm. You are you are automatically charged a tax. Well, if I'm you're talking a about federal, federal income tax. Right, for right, yeah. right. You And if you don't do that, you're penalized. So I don't know if, if every example is, is going to be reflective mm. because you're not penalized if you don't vote. I mean, you're penalized in the sense that the people that are not going to support you potentially get elected or issues passed that you don't like. Mm. Um, but we're not saying that your vote is automatic, but voter registration is mm -hmm. automatic. And so that basic bureaucratic red tape step is just eliminated. Because at the end of the day, we're, we're creating a barrier and more bureaucracy when we're saying you have to physically go either to a website or to a location mm -hmm. and fill out a form. If we just do automatic voter registration, you still have to make the effort to research your candidates and actually go vote. Nobody's right. going to you know, uh, force you to do that. You have to do it on your own accord and feel the inspiration, motivation to do that. Um, but to not worry about the bureaucracy, because again, there there are circumstances, especially for young people that want to vote, that miss the deadline. You know, there were so many occasions at UCF um, where I would be organizing students mm -hmm. to go register and get vote and, and go vote and meet someone who just missed the deadline. And if they were just automatically registered, if they all of a sudden it felt inspiration and go vote, they would still be able to do it. So under that logic, should a driver's license be automatic? Because There's definitely a bureaucratic process involved. You know, my, my, my question to you would be, you know, our legislature has enacted uh, various degrees of voter education, a process to confirm identity, you know, information regarding your rights and responsibilities as a voter. You know, so, so the act of actually registering gives you access and, and resources to empower you to go and vote the same way driver's education helps make safe and responsible drivers uh, driver's license costs money and a driver's license is a privilege and a mm -hmm. driver's license requires training mm -hmm. you don't have to go to a, a training and take classes to actually register to vote and you don't mm -hmm. pay to register to vote at least our hope is that you don't pay to register to vote mm -hmm. right. uh, there should be a poll tax affiliate with that so again i, I think the comparisons are are not are not fair. Mm -hmm. uh, a driver's license is a completely different dynamic. There are many people that don't have a driver's license, but also are registered to vote because they don't have access to mm -hmm. transportation. So I just don't think the two are equivalent. So, so another question uh, that I have for you, you know, just uh, out of curiosity, given the state of the world right now and the condition of the country, uh, vaccination, proof of vaccination is now required in many states and cities to enter a restaurant, to go into a bar, uh, to show up at your place of employment. Uh, as we are both well aware, our polling locations were awfully crowded this past election cycle. Uh, do you see uh, uh, circumstances or would you be supportive of requiring proof of vaccination to enter a polling location? I think that would turn out to be potentially restrictive because we know that not every person is vaccinated and there's also barriers and hesitation among different cultural groups mm -hmm. why folks are not vaccinated so i would be very careful going down that road of putting more requirements on top of voting right well i was curious <laughs> thank you representatives <clears throat> our time has expired for our cross-examination <clears throat> and we now have uh brings us to our closing remarks so this is our opportunity. We have four minutes, each of us, to, uh, to sell it uh, and to bring it home and to wrap things up as to why your position is the correct position. The first uh, closer will be Representative Saroy with four minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Murrow. And you were right. The questions, the questions were fun. I, I enjoyed them. And it's always a pleasure to be with you, uh, in, especially <laughs> in Brevard County, Same. Representative Escamani. Um, you know, I hope that our time today has proven two things. Uh, first, two elected representatives with pretty strong and, and very different views on a subject matter uh, can sit down and have a civil uh, conversation about, about the, the legislation and the merits and pros and cons of it. Um, 
secondly, I hope that uh, throughout this hour, your viewers will look at this issue not in terms of what's being uh, fed to them by, you know, the talking heads on television or some of the false claims that are out there on social media. Uh, I will admit I supported President Trump. And I know there's a narrative that likes to suggest that this bill was a knee-jerk reaction to, to his loss. Uh, but I will tell you, for me, as an individual House member, the security of our elections should be an annual, an annual effort. It should be an annual goal. In the past, legislatures passed bills related to voter education. Uh, we've passed legislation that created a pathway for, for uh, felons to have restorations of their voting rights. Uh, we've done a lot of things in terms of some of the technological failures that we saw after the 2000 pre presidential election. So this bill is the latest effort uh, to provide more integrity and transparency in the security of our, of our elections process. And I'm proud of it in terms of being a work product. Um, you know, I, I know that other members have motivations for why they support or oppose pieces of legislation. But for me, this was a very uh, easy subject matter to take a look at. When we talk about accessibility, I think it's important to remind voters that you have anywhere between 40 and 45 days to request and cast a ballot. Upwards of 30 days from the election, you can call your supervisor of elections office or go in and request an absentee ballot that will be mailed to the address that you give on file. If you have to make a change to your registration, this bill requires you to provide two forms of identification in order to make that change a very standard practice. If you called your doctor's office today to ask for an appointment, they'd ask for your date of birth and the last four digits of your social security number. So this is nothing outrageous. This is not a conspiracy to block people from access to polls. We also have in Florida between eight and 14 days of early voting. And early voting is a tremendous convenience. Regardless of where you live in the county, you can go to any early voting site and cast your ballot. And then finally, if you have not had the opportunity to, to stop in at one of those uh, opportunities to vote, you can go to your neighborhood precinct on election day and cast your ballot. Uh, so, you know, I, I see nothing wrong with this legislation in terms of hindering people's ability to access to the polls. There are things that we, that we have, privileges and responsibilities as citizens of this country outlined in the Constitution that require us to take action and ownership on our part. This is a this is a, a democracy in a country where we all have to actively participate to make it work. And I think that voting is is a central and basic uh, tenet of that idea. You can choose to participate or choose not to participate, but nothing should be handed out to anyone on a silver platter, whether it's military registering for military service, jury duty, uh, voting. You know, there are things that require active involvement on our part as responsible citizens. And this bill is one more step. Uh, toward confirming that uh, right and privilege that we all have as citizens of this country. Thank you, Representative Soroy. And with our four-minute close for Representative Escamani. Thank you so much. Thank you again for this opportunity. And it's, it's been a, a pleasure to debate this issue with Representative Soroy. Um, and so I, I'll close with a few quick points. I mean, first of all, um, yes, government... It must be participatory. That is the foundational piece of this country, of our foundation, is that uh, you have the opportunity to engage in the process, to express yourself. Um, but in the, the day, as lawmakers, we should not be making it more difficult to participate. We should make it as easy and clear cut to participate. And I do think that when we pass legislation like Senate Bill 90, it's doing the opposite. It's designed to make the process a little more muddier, a little more confusing, a little more red tape. And I'm all about cutting that red tape. I, I don't think we need to make a process that's designed to be participatory more difficult to participate in. I do want to add that uh, there, there are media heads talking about this issue, as with every issue. Um, but our, our governor feeds into that. He signed this bill to a live Fox News audience and did not even allow local press to be present. Um, signing a bill in front of a Fox News audience is a political message. That is not about public service or what is the good interest of the people of Florida, especially when you don't even allow local media in to tell the local perspective. And so again, this really was a political bill from the very beginning of its inception to its conclusion. Um, I do want to add some of the changes that took place in voter registration, which we didn't talk about as much, I think really do add 
a deeper perspective from the negative side. When you do voter registration in Florida, you have to register as a third party organization and you have to fill out paperwork with the state. Those were changes made about, about a decade ago. Now, someone who is registered with the state to register voters has to tell a potential new voter that I might turn in your form late and you can just do this online, which is parts of a script that the legislature has added to the process to basically dissuade someone from getting registered to vote with a volunteer. So again, these changes are not designed to maintain uh, transparency or integrity or ethics or security. In fact, we should be concerned about foreign interference. We should be concerned about sham candidates and the role that social media plays in dissuading or pushing different narratives. But at the end of the day, uh, there were there were no fraud with vote by mail. There was there was no fraud when it comes to even even voter registration. And yet, this was the direction the legislature set to go. And so, I, I do want to stress to folks to vote uh, to not let these barriers get in your way. And um, to echo the points of my colleague, um, the participatory nature of our democracy is critical for its success. And so please don't, don't feel dissuaded by the process because of policies like this. Um, I want to encourage you to not only vote, but to get involved in the legislative process, because I have no doubt these types of efforts will continue as it's been in Florida's history to make it more difficult to vote. Um, and we need everyone engaged in the process to prevent it from happening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, students across uh, our campuses have submitted questions in our online portal. Uh, some of them are addressed specifically to representatives. Some are more open-ended. Uh, we're going to begin in our remaining few moments with a question uh, from Shauna for Representative Escamani. And her question is, if we take security measures to protect our homes, why wouldn't we take extra security uh, pr uh, provisions to protect our election system? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so we already have. And again, I, I think when you secure your home, you think about where are the risky spots of my home? Is, is it the windows? Is it the doors? Um, the wall is probably not an area where you need to secure more. It's gonna be very difficult to break into a wall. And I, and I think that's the concern with Senate Bill 90 is that yes, I mean, foreign interference is a serious concern. Um, uh, these sham candidates, the fact that fake candidates can run for office in Florida and take away votes from other candidates is a serious election concern. Uh, but there was no concern when it came to the vote by mail process. The fact that voters could request a vote, by mail, a vote by mail ballot for two elections has been the norm for a very long time and there's been no problems with it. Um, and so again, it's not that election security isn't important, it is important, it's paramount, but to, to actually pursue it in a way that is based on what is the recommendation by supervisor of election offices, I mean, I assume when you get your house secured, you're gonna seek advice from law enforcement or seek advice from security professionals. Imagine doing that and ignoring everything those security professionals told you. That's what Senate Bill 90 is. Thank you. Uh, question for Representative Soroy from Hunter. Uh, Hunter says that it seems that it is Republicans who are trying to restrict voting across the country. Are Republicans afraid of a higher vote turnout? Well, Hunter, thank you very much for the question. And, and I would say no, not afraid of a, a higher turnout. Look, I, I will be the first person to tell you, I believe that elections should be won or lost based on the quality of the ideas, the character of the candidates, uh, the, the civility of the discussion, and, and our campaigns are a reflection of how we act when we govern. So I think it's important for voters to be savvy, to look, to look at candidates and understand the issues and cast their vote accordingly. As a, as a current uh, Republican elected official, I'm not afraid uh, to stand up to the scrutiny of the electorate. And I'm certainly not afraid uh, of people casting their votes for or against me based on the ideas that I present on the campaign trail. I think the more people that vote in our state and our country, the better it is for our democracy, uh, the better it is for the policies that our gov uh, government produces. So I, I, don't have, uh, I don't have an issue with higher turnout. As a matter of fact, I think that when history looks back on this period of time in our country, uh, one of the things that will be celebrated is the fact that in a 100-year global pandemic, we had record voter turnout across our state and our nation. Um, both candidates received more votes 
uh, than anyone in their, their respective parties had up until this point, which is an incredible accomplishment for our country. So, Hunter, I appreciate the question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, another question, uh, it, it isn't addressed to anyone in particular. So, uh, Kimberly asks, is it true that SB 90 will disenfranchise more voters who are African American? Mm. So whoever would like to tackle that one. I, I'll start, Representative, if you don't mind. <clears throat> I, I think, again, this is one of the, the false narratives that's been presented uh, regarding this piece of legislation. You know, the, the media and Facebook and, and different interest groups have put out there that because of the additional security that we want to provide drop boxes in particular, uh, that it somehow is going to make them less accessible to people in various neighborhoods uh, around our communities. What this bill does, first of all, is it requires uh, the location of these drop boxes to be announced and advertised 30 days prior to the election. I believe in most instances they're going to be placed at early voting sites uh, throughout the county in terms of convenience uh, so supervisors of elections can maintain uh, eyes on them, if you will, to provide for the security of the drop box. But again, you know, whether it's drop boxes or early voting or requesting an absentee ballot or voting at your precinct on election day, we all have we all have equal access and convenience to whatever voting uh, method makes sense for each of us. So I think while for some in the media and politics, it might be, you know, an, an argument that sparks some interest to say the legislature's out to hurt this group of people or to help that group of people with this elections bill. Uh, I just don't see that being in the, ca it, the case. And if I thought that this bill was going to do something to deny people the right to access the polls, I would have voted against it. That would have been my constitutional duty to serve the oath that I took. So, so you know, in reading this bill, I, I don't see where uh, it disenf disenfranchises certain groups of people. Well, and I'll just add to that. It might not be explicitly stated, but I think the concern of, of this question, the concern of civil rights organizations and African-American pastors, I mean, there's been so many church leaders um, who have advocated against this legislation for fear that it could disenfranchise different communities, including communities of color. And I think a lot of that concern is based on not just the historic uh, uh, precedent that a state like Florida has demonstrated where policies are perpetuated that directly target African Americans. I mean, in particular, rights restoration legislation in the past that's going to make it more difficult for returning citizens to get the right to vote um, restored. We also see, um, of course, this past legislative session, House Bill 1, which was in response to uh, protest around black lives. And so I, I think that there's just a a concern because of past actions by the legislative body that that is the target of different policies that have to do with civil rights and voting rights. Um, but even on a more practical position, uh, we do see long lines predominantly at communities that are working class, communities that are students, communities that are people of color. And so when you put into place different types of restrictions around around the act of voting, the concern is that those restrictions will lead to a surprise of election official not having adequate resources to staff uh, election locations of different populations of people, um, which can create barriers for, for voting. And there's also the, the concern around just transportation barriers, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, For those of means, voting within the time span that is made available in Florida, as my colleague have outlined, is not a challenge, but for those that have working class background, no transportation that's reliable, children they have to take care of, um, they work multiple jobs to make ends meet, it can be even more challenging to vote. And the thought that is you, if you put these barriers in place, then communities of color who historically are disenfranchised will just face that more. Representative <coughs> Tyler Saroy, District 51. <coughs> State Representative Anna Escamani, District 47. Today, uh, unfortunately, our hour is up. Our time has concluded. Today was, I think, the quintessential example of American democracy at its finest. We were passionate, we were intellectual, we were engaged, and we were civil. I want to thank you again for being here today. Have a great Constitution Day. Thank you.